your head down and blend in as much as possible. At least that's what my family would tell me. And then they named me Atsuko Okatsuka. <laughs> and then they went on to choose English names for themselves. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> or Linda. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another in our Race in America series here on Washington Post Live. I'm Elahe Izadi, co-host of Post Reports and a media reporter here at The Post. My guest today just won a Gracie Award for Best Stand-Up Special for her first HBO special, Intruder. But this is only part of her story and we're going to get into it today. Atsuko Okatsuka joins me now. Atsuko, thank you so much for making time for us. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you too, of course. It's a pleasure. Oh my gosh, thanks for the beautiful, nice intro. Yes, of course, and we're so happy to have you here on Washington Post Live. Um, I'm happy that you know we briefly met at the Gracie Awards a couple weeks ago. And you know, in your Gracie's Awards acceptance speech, you encouraged people to really find their superpowers and you kind of touched on how your life experiences really allowed you to find that for yourself. So I wanna start there and I wanna start with one of your comedic inspirations um, in talking about your comedy journey. And that was the first Asian American comic to have an HBO special, Margaret Chow. Cho, my bad, Margaret Cho, and then you, 22 years later, became the second Asian American to have an HBO special. You know, reflecting on that time span, that's more than two decades, what does it right. mean to you personally to follow in Margaret's footsteps in that way? Yeah, it kind of feels like full circle because she was the first stand-up comedian I'd ever seen on mm -hmm. screen. You know, it was through a DVD that a friend of mine uh, at church uh, like secretly passed me during a sermon and was like, shh, shh, hey, uh, take this home, watch it, stand up comedy. Like it was some contraband. Uh, and then I went, I see, home sorry, I have to stop you. I see your, is that your husband in the background? My husband's there. Yeah, it's not an intruder. I know that, I know that it, yeah, my special is about an intruder that came to our house three times on the same day. But yes, that is, I saw him while I was talking and I was like, yeah. who's that? And, you know, I still have, I still have PTSD. Uh, because the yeah. intruder happened to look like my husband too, but yeah, yeah, which we'll talk <laughs> but, about in a moment. But I just wanted to shout sure. him out briefly. <laughs> you know, in life, sometimes like you know, it just the universe sends you things that naturally turns into a great segue. So yeah, it was just yeah. the wrong time because we were talking about Margaret Cho. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, Margaret, yeah, she was the first stand up I'd seen. So you know, it, it was amazing that you know, we're friends now and, mm. um, and she was there to celebrate also, you know, when I got the HBO special, um, I went over to her house and we made a video about it, you know, and we both hoped that the third person, you know, third Asian American female stand up to have an HBO special, it'll take, uh, less time in between, you know? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying about how someone at church just passed you a DVD like it was contraband, can you tell me a little bit more about what your experience was like watching her for the first time and what impact that had on you? Like when you first saw Margaret perform, what what did it feel like to you? Well, it's multiple things because A, I didn't know stand-up comedy was an art form. I didn't know it was a job. So my mind was already blown there where I was like, you could just do this for a whole hour this woman is holding court and the audience is just watching and, and really into her stories and laughing at the same time while she's just being an open book and unapologetically herself. I had never seen any other art form like this, you know? So that was already mind blowing. And then on top of that, she looked like me, you know? And so it was like, I don't, I don't know if I blacked out after that. My mind, you know, your mind can only get blown so many times when you're young. 
where it's like, okay, give me a moment, <laughs> give me a moment to the point. I didn't even, you know, it didn't even hit that part of my, my heart and soul yet that I wanted to do it too, because I was just so excited to even see that representation, you know, and I didn't have enough confidence back then to have bold thoughts like that could be me. <laughs> I, I, I think it's so cool when people do have that within them, but I was nowhere near the self-confidence I have today to be able to even watch her do something like that and then think, ah, yeah, I can see me doing it too. No way. I was like, I think only 10 people are allowed to do stand-up comedy at a time, you know, <laughs> especially during that time. Yeah, yeah. Things have changed so much. And actually, it's interesting because Margaret is someone who a lot of more con like newer comics, even in the past five, 10 years, have cited that they had a similar experience when mm -hmm. watching her and her special 22 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, just reflecting on that, what has changed in comedy between then and now to, to you know, lead to this moment for you and having your HBO special? Is there anything in particular that really stands out to you? Yeah, I think, you know, the people always speak, you know, and with the industry, the entertainment industry, with a lot of industries, there's only a few deciders, right? Maybe like 10 deciders. And if the 10 deciders don't look like or reflect what the people are like, then they're going to choose the people they feel comfortable with. And so when I was saying, you know, in my child brain, in my kid brain, I thought only 10 comedians were allowed to be comedians at a time in the United States is because, you know, it wasn't people that maybe looked like me or reflected a lot of communities uh, because the deciders look a certain way too, you know, and as they got more diverse and, um, and sometimes, and, and, and more people were uh, exposed to comedy that helps too, you know, um, for the people to go, we like this stand-up comedy and we like these different voices doing stand-up comedy. And you can see the demand for it, whether it's in social media, especially in social media, because that's where you as a performer can speak directly to the people. Um, and that's what's changed, I think, you know, is comedians being able to be on their phone talking to their fans and through, you know, followers or numbers, um, you can show the deciders, hey, like, people want this, people crave um, this representation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so that's, that's what's uh, changed, where you don't need, you know, the man or whatever to make sure you do have a special. Some comedians are cutting out that middle person, you know, and putting their specials straight onto YouTube, for example, because that reaches the people and for free, you know, yeah. yeah. Asko, unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulty with our connection, so we're working to get that connection back up. So we're going to take a brief pause here. Washington Post Live audience, stick with us. We're just going to hit reset here in a moment, and uh, hopefully we'll have a much clearer connection to hear Asko's answers more clearly.
And we're back with Otsuko Okatsuka. Thank you so much for everyone sticking with us. And I'm so happy to have you back here with us. Um, oh. We just left off with you talking about, you know, how social media and how the internet has sort of democratized comedy and allowed comedians to speak more directly with their audiences. Um, I want to pick up from there and ask you a little bit more about what shaped your comedic voice beyond comedy? I know that dance plays a big role in your life. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about how dance has influenced your comedy. For sure, yeah. Well, also back to the Wi-Fi thing, the internet thing, you have to make sure yeah. you have a good Wi-Fi connection for it to be able to talk to your fans and speak to the people, which uh, I feel like is pretty relevant since we had to take a break because of my Wi-Fi. Um, so... With dance, yeah, I think, you know, dance, <laughs> I'm a very physical performer, so I use a lot of my my facial expressions, my eyes, you know, which I consider still to be a part of dance uh, when, I, when I try to tell a story or even when I'm setting up a punchline. Um, and I think that has to do a lot with, you know, also being an immigrant, you know, when I didn't speak English as well, I, um, I would use a lot of physical, you know, comedy to try to connect to people. Um, and if it makes sense, if you know my stand-up comedy, this will really truly, I think, make the most sense by saying is that um, I learned English watching Scooby-Doo and I think it comes out, you know, in the way I, ooh, you know, oh, you know, <laughs> the way I react to things. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in the opening sequence, we saw a quote from you where you talked about the title of your special intruder. We mentioned earlier that your husband was in the background, not an intruder, although if you watch the special, you know that they kind of look alike. Um, but there seems to be a double meaning to that title of your stand-up special, and you've talked about feeling like an outsider in, in your own life um, in this country. So can you tell us a little bit more and unpack that? What what is that meaning, the meaning of the title intruder mean to you? Yeah, I think there is a double entendre, you know, where there was a literal physical intruder that wasn't welcome in our home, but I joke it's not really our home because it's our landlord's home. So it's like all these yeah. things, it's like, what does it even mean to be intruded on in your space? And maybe that space doesn't even technically quote unquote belong to you. And why doesn't it belong to you? Well, there's like the housing crisis and all these things, you know, that I don't go into in my stand-up. I'm very like silly first, but you know, if you wanted to do a uh, academic like <laughs> breakdown of my show and the title of my show, you know, you would see all these things. Like as a formerly undocumented immigrant, I didn't, I, there were parts in my life where I felt like I was intruding upon other people too. like. And some might have seen me as one as well because, you know, they don't have papers. Um, are you even allowed to be here? And who decided that in the first place? <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, that title means a lot to me. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And it's interesting you saying how, you know, you lead with the silly first in your act and in your special, you very beautifully woven through this one story, um, your life story, but not in this heavy handed way. And, you know, for those who don't know a little bit about your life story, my understanding is you correct me if I'm wrong. You moved mm -hmm. um, to the United States from Japan when you were 10, thinking, you know, you'd only be there for a couple months. You, you lived, but you ended up living with your mother and your grandmother in your uncle's garage after your tourist visa expired. So you became an undocumented immigrant. And I know that there's a lot to unpack within that experience. But one question I had was, did you see your comedic sensibility or voice emerge in those years? Like how did, did comedy and humor emerge as a way for you to respond to what was happening in your life? Yeah, you know, I think like my MO every day is to have a human connection with other people. I love people and so like i was saying before with my dance you know having or me being a physical performer uh coming from wanting to connect with people sometimes if you don't have the language you use facial expressions to be like that was weird or you know do you feel the same way you know if you don't have the language and so you know 
I think all of that came about during that time where I was desperately trying to learn English as fast as I can so I could make friends. But, you know, that was that that took a longer time. And so, you know, I would try to do funny, like physical movements to try to get people to laugh, you know, um, to to connect with them. And hopefully they would want to be my friend or same with my mom. You know, my mom has um, mental illness and, you know, like there was a lot of tension in the house and sadness in the house, you know, because, um, yeah, we didn't have that much space. And suddenly we weren't with our friends. We weren't in in our home that was Japan suddenly, especially for me who didn't know um, that we were going to stay in the States. Um, and so, yeah, I would take like dark moments and try to cut the tension by saying a joke, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think that definitely developed during that time from yeah. my need to connect and, you know, and so, so life wouldn't be so bleak for me too. You know, a lot of it was also for me to keep my sanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 it's a it's it's a response that we sometimes see among especially refugee communities immigrant communities and and how humor can be employed in all of these sorts of situations um and you mentioned your mother and in the special you you talk about how she has schizophrenia and the way you talk about it is is really it's really hilarious and one question i had while watching it and you know in your interviews as well when you talk about your life is is it scary for you to talk about these things that are actually deeply personal? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> how did you decide to, to go there in your comedy? Oh, here's the thing, Elahe. It's uh, when you have a healthy dose of what do you, an ego, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, you're know just that. like, look, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm an open yeah. book. This is what I do. <laughs> okay everyone has to deal with it and you know of yeah. course it's got to be a happy balance but um no it's only in being an open book and sharing things from my life you know in an honest way that i could i feel free to <laughs> so um yeah it's only like a service you know it, it's yeah it, it actually makes me feel more comfortable to be like yes today i tripped and fell Yesterday, I stepped in dog poop. Like, I have to tell you these things or else, um, yeah, I don't feel like I'm being my true authentic self. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. And, it's like and I think that's... in the face, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Then you're facing the fears of like being embarrassed or feeling like an outsider, all the things that I used to feel as a kid. And that's what it was, was I didn't have a place to share it, maybe. Because when you do share the truth about, yourself that might make you feel embarrassed or make you feel like a weirdo it's not until then that other people can also go oh, i feel seen wait i do that i feel that way that's my life story too you know and then there and then boom there goes the community you know but it's yeah. not until you do that you know you open up as well that yeah you and i think one people thing people like you Oh, excuse me. Sorry, we're we're jumping or we're jumping a little bit in the connection, but I I can hear you much better now than before. So apologies if I interview uh, interrupted you. Um, no, no. Yeah. So Osco, also, it's interesting you say that because I think with your comedy, especially, you kind of invite people in. So rather than you know maybe feeling that you have these experiences and they're very solitary for you, you're inviting people in to laugh along at life with you, rather than you know, people laughing at you or you laughing at other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's again, because my like inspiration to be in the arts, to be a performer is other people. Um, I would never want to approach it in a way that uh, makes people feel not seen or even worse. Um, like I'm, I'm bringing them down, you know, that's not the point of stand-up comedy for me. And so, yeah, and there's different approaches to comedy, trust. Yeah. And you yeah. might have seen it where there are, you know, other approaches where it's like it is punching down or it is making fun of other people. And that's fine, but that's not the community that I'm trying to cultivate. Yeah. 
Um, another person who, in addition to your husband, Ryan, who features very prominently, um, not just in your act, but in your popular TikTok account is your grandmother. So we actually have a clip. So let's take a look right now. Remember this video, Grandma? Mm -hmm. So that one has 761,000 views. Oh. That one with me and you in it. Yeah. Oh, but to no money. <laughs> yeah, no money. <laughs> 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 I love that one. <laughs> She's, I understand, is she in her 80s? How do you get her to participate in these videos? She's in her 80s and she's been sort of a caretaker all her life. And so, you know, these moments where we can play and, uh, yeah, you know, when we're making videos, it's sort of a time for her to be able to tap into, I think, her childlike self that she rarely got to me growing up, you know, she raised three kids on her own. And then she raised me too, because my mom, you know, was sort of unstable and her health wasn't well. So yeah, it's in her eighties. She's finally being able to cut loose. And I think, you know, she was, yeah. And be more honest because that's a funny video. Sure. But that's still her being brutally honest. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ha ha ha. And then you cry later. Yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, you're right. I'm not getting paid for these viral videos. <laughs> and then you go in a corner and cry by yourself or like your nose starts to bleed, you know, because the truth hits. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's that's been my relationship with my grandma too, ever since I was a kid. Like having this sort of playful interaction with her? Uh, the, the complexity of that playful interaction where you know i laugh now ha 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 oh my gosh i thought i was coming to the states for a two-month vacation isn't that funny i packed lightly ha 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 and then now you know we've overstayed our visa for 12 years or whatever you know now now we laugh now i laugh because i'm a citizen now and all that but at the time i mean it was kind of a kidnapping that's the complexity of me and my grandma's relationship that I'm talking about. She lied. She, I was bamboozled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, and I, I'm sure there are people to varying degrees can relate to some, to some element of this, but to see this relationship play out in your TikTok videos and this like sort of short snippets is it's entertaining for a lot of us, but I think it's really resonating with people. So I do also have to bring up the drop it challenge, which featured Beyonce's song partition. You know, in this, here's the video. Uh, and for those of you at home, it's playing Beyonce's partition at this like amazing drop beat. So we're watching it here. And you know, at this point, when this video comes out, it goes viral, but you had already been doing stand up for 13 years, I think, at that point. What was it like for you to see this be the thing that made you go viral and made you go global? Yeah, I think it's funny, you know, and I, you know, it's just me and my grandma. Honestly, videos like that, it's again, us just running from drama. <laughs> so hurry, uh, you know, maybe if we dance, hurry, if we dance and, you know, make this video, we will think about that one divorce or schizophrenia, you know, um, <laughs> and maybe people see that in the videos if you look really closely but also it's us genuinely trying to have a good time and i think people could really relate to that um you know that video came out when i think like a year into the pandemic i think people were just getting starting to get vaccinated and so there was still a feeling of isolation i think across the world and so this quote unquote challenge that we accidentally invented you know, we were literally just grocery shopping in little Tokyo, having fun. And that song was stuck in my head. And so I was like, oh, what if I just drop every time the beat drops too? My body also drops, you know? It was just really us having fun, but it was cool that other people felt, again, seen and was like, oh, maybe I can do that too in my day to day, you know? Again, which is why I got into performing anyway, right? Is to make that connection with people. So it, it was really cool to see. And then I was like, you know what? It's the people's challenge now. Mm -hmm. It's not about getting paid or anything, because again, you don't, not for viral videos. I think yeah. I got as your Beyonce grandmother told us. <laughs> That's right. Don't get it twisted. It's just yeah. for the people, you know. And I even got Beyonce paid more money because because of that challenge, her song made it back into the, like the top charts or something because it's a song from a few years ago 
Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it was a service for the people. And I love it because a human person, an entertainer is not just, you know, one way it's, we are multifaceted, you know, there is a dance background, for example, you know, and there's reasoning for that, for example. And so sometimes it's not, it's going to take a silly dance video for the world to notice. And then, and then they're like, oh my gosh. And then she does stand up and I, I connect to that too, you know? And so that's cool. I mean, the yeah, first time yeah. I went viral, the first time I went viral was during a stand-up clip, actually, where a mm -hmm. 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit while I was performing. And sometimes it's just going to take, you know, wild things like that for people to go, oh, now I'll just watch her do regular stand-up. Like, I don't have to survive <laughs> an earthquake for you to find yeah. me. You know what I mean? To, to want to continue watching me. But, yeah, you know, people yeah. need a hook. People need a hook. And I think there's something to, we have a few minutes left here, and I want to get to this question about broader representation. I do think there's something to, when you have those moments that can go viral, are you then prepared for the moment? And I think the earthquake example is great. The drop it challenge is great because these these things went viral, but you were also performing and refining your your craft for, for many years at those points. So, so being prepared for that moment. I did want to ask you, you know, you're having this moment now, and I'm also thinking about, you know, going back to the first HBO special from an Asian American co comedian. And since then, we've seen a lot of different Asian American comedians have specials on different networks and selling out nationally and, and, and very from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Do you think we're in a moment of a of a golden era for Asian American comedy? I think so. I think it's a golden era for every community, hopefully, because again, as people thirst for and ask for it, you know, uh, and understand, and stand up comedy becomes more of in the zeitgeist of every everyone's everyday life. Um, yeah, I think it's the beginning of a golden era for all the communities that felt like they hadn't been seen before, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, it's so exciting. we're, it's exciting. yeah, we're, we're just about out of time before I let you go. I know you're going on tour soon. Um, where are you going next in your act? What should audiences expect to see you tackle next? Yeah. yeah. So I'm really tapping into the childlike self right now for me. Um, I, touch on it a little bit in The Intruder, but I want to really explore that side more, you know, asking uh, hard questions about adulthood, like how do you make friends as an adult, you know, because it was easier as kids, because our schedules were dictated by other people. And, you know, we were made to hold hands when, when we're in a line for example, when you're kids, but as an adult, you're kind of on your own with things like that. And so, yeah, I sort of talk about the hardships of adulthood and kind of encourage people to tap into their childlike self a little more in this new hour. That's why it's called full grown tour mm -hmm. because I'm not full grown, but we all <laughs> act like we all have to act like we are, but we're all just shells of adults. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Atsuko Okatsuka, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Thank you for having me. And sorry about my Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's all good. We made it work. Um, thanks to all of you for watching. To check out what other interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find out more information about our upcoming programs. I'm Elahe Izadi, and thanks for joining Washington Post Live.